Hello. Hi, everybody. And look how dark it is. It's eight o'clock um, Central Time uh, on uh, Tuesday, September 19th. Uh, the times, they are changes. I know uh, just a couple of days we will be uh, crossing over on the calendar into fall, but we've certainly been seeing a lot of signs of fall around us, haven't we? Early fall, a bit of color starting to change uh, on the leaves. Uh, certainly a lot of birds have been migrating through uh, dragonfly migration that we talked about last week. Um, we're going to get into some more of uh, things that are happening uh, seasonally in this area, but I, I got a couple of show and tell things. Um, what, and you know what? Somebody tell me if we already talked about this. I can't remember if I brought this up uh, when I got it a couple of weeks ago. Did we talk about this rock with this trilobite on it? Um, I was so excited uh, to uh, see I had a little package on my desk. And then uh, this was at uh, Good Natured World Headquarters. I was excited to see that somebody brought me something. And then... <laughs> No offense to the powers that be, but I saw it was from human resources. And yeah, you always wonder, you know, when you get something from human resources, just what exactly is it going to be? Well, in this case, it was something super cool. Our human resources manager found this rock. She said she was at home for lunch and she looked down and here was this rock. And she said, it looks like it has a fossil. And she's exactly right. Um, not just any fossil, this is a trilobite. Um, and that's kind of akin to saying, uh, this is a beetle. I, I I thought it would be really cool if I could key this out and we could talk about, uh, trilobite culture way back in the day. These lived between 200 million and 400 million years ago, which was a time when this, uh, part of the country we call Illinois was uh, part of a vast inland sea. Uh, it was also located farther south than it is today. The continents, you know, they have shifted and drifted over time. So it was warm. Uh, the sea was shallow. Uh, lots of little crustacean-type creatures lived in that water. I have to say, I have spent, I was going to say, all of my adult life, but it actually extends into my kid life, too. I've looked my whole as long as I can remember, I've been trying to find a trilobite uh, being led to believe that they would be fairly common. They kind of are. I mean, as far as um, uh, bedrock goes, this is where we would find creatures like this. This is um, called dolomite, which is it's kind of like limestone. It's a, a sedimentary rock. And this little creature um, died. <laughs> 200 million to 400 million years ago, and then through uh, changes in pressure and time, this uh, these particles of sand and stone were turned into this rock. And I just thought it was it was really cool. It's going to make a really great paperweight. I've actually been taking it with me uh, on the outreach programs that we're doing this month too. So it's been pretty popular and. Now you guys have gotten to see it too. If I find out anything or if I meet anyone who's able to key this out further, because if we could find out a little bit more about what type of trilobite this is, that might, I, I've heard some people say trilobite. I was taught trilobite. So pick one <laughs> that you uh, like best. Uh, we could find out a little bit more about how it spent its time here on earth. Um, maybe even you know, what it's what it's ecological niche was uh, what it's uh, what it's rose what, what ate it what it ate things like that but for right now we're just gonna say it's a really cool fossil and it was a gift from human resources um, I'm gonna put this somewhere where I won't forget it out here and then we're gonna go to this box this came uh, last week too and it's from our buddy Paul who um, he's a, a hunter, uh, but he also has uh, uh, permits for um, picking up salvage animals, which he does um, 
when he sees something cool. He's actually done some taxidermy mounts for us too. We have our black squirrel mount, which if I was at uh, World Headquarters, it would be the mount that you sometimes see off of my left shoulder, a, a black squirrel that we found as a roadkill here, uh, uh, actually over in Geneva. Uh, it met its maker on Peck Road. Well, Paul found this nice example of a fox squirrel. Um, fox squirrels are uh, probably the less, not that they're uncommon, but we seem to have fewer fox squirrels than we do gray squirrels in this area. Um, fox squirrels have an orange tint to their belly. It's kind of getting washed out here because of the light situation, but this is a pretty deep you can see the orange better on uh, the tail, the contrast there in the tail. He uh, picked this up and got a tan. He also did the same with this uh, long-tailed weasel. Uh, this isn't a, a least weasel. This is an adult um, uh, long-tailed weasel in its summer pelage, which is the brown color. This is an animal that turns white in the winter. There's its belly. Um, and then this, this is a groundhog, also known as a woodchuck. And we, we talked about them recently and how about how groundhogs um, aren't ground dwelling all the time. Uh, well, they, they sleep in it. They, they have a burrow that they have actually a pretty extensive burrow system that they create but they can climb trees. Um, this is, um, I don't know if we call this one quite full grown or not. The males can get to be 12 pounds. Um, farther north, they can get to be 14, maybe 15 pounds. Um, and good size animals. What Paul pointed out to me and what I think is so interesting, um, this, hide i wish you guys could feel this this is it feels like cow hide this is really tough leather here um paul said that he'd heard that um people would actually harvest groundhog slash woodchucks for this this hide be, it was so tough they could make um softballs out of softballs and and baseballs out of it so uh tough stuff i would imagine it would uh offer some protection from predators, not, it wouldn't be foolproof, but you, you know, you've heard that term, you have to have a pretty thick skin. Well, um, groundhogs do. <laughs> you know, uh, I forget when we talked about them before. I know we talked about how they, they climb up in trees, um, but they um, uh, perform a, uh, a pretty valuable function for other wildlife in the fact that they can dig. Can you see these claws here? They're not as as big um, as a badger, but they are just as powerful when it comes to digging. Now, badgers are predators, so they can use their claws for grabbing prey too. But uh, the the woodchuck's uh, front claws are used for extensive burrowing. Uh, they go down, these are our true hibernators, one of very few true hibernators that we have in this area. So they go down, um, they dig down below the frost line, usually maybe four feet down. Their burrows will actually have chambers in them, um, not for food storage because their only way of storing food for the winter, so they don't get up and eat, they store it in their bodies uh, is brown fat. Some of it is uh, is brown fat. It's a fat that burns more slowly than white fat uh, over time. Um, but as they're digging these burrows, they're providing the service for other animals that need holes but can't dig them. Like uh, probably the best example I can think of is snakes. We always think of snakes as living in the ground. But when you think about how is a snake, especially in, in uh, Northern Illinois soil, it's not sandy around here. Um, how are these going to dig those holes that they need? They're going to let somebody else do it. So um, the burrows of chipmunks can, uh, chipmunks of groundhogs slash woodchucks can have uh, lots of chambers uh, that other animals, uh, the woodchuck might use them during different seasons of the year, but the, uh, the uh, animals like snakes, uh, 
other rodents in mice, which don't hibernate, but might need a place to duck and get out of uh, some bad weather. They can all take advantage of the hard work of the woodchuck slash groundhog. Um, all right, that's, that's kind of it for, for show and tell for this week, but um, I do have a slide that relates to that. So I'll tell you, every week I have to relearn this. Let me see if I can remember, uh, punch this in so that we share uh, the right screen. There we go. Commercial for the St. Charles Park District. Um, let's go over here. Um, I dug this photo out. This is, um, I didn't take this photo. This was uh, from, gosh, probably six or seven years ago. My friend Nikki had opened up her property for release of a woodchuck that had needed some real rehabilitation, He'd been injured. Uh, and that's him there on the left. This is uh, the woodchuck she named Wally. And I could not get over it. I remember when she posted this picture, but I forgot just how roly-poly Wally was. Uh, and these are, again, they're, they're animals that hibernate. So they need to pack on enough fat to last them. In, in this climate around here, it's through November, December, January, February, March, April. That's probably half the year they are going to be underneath the ground. So this was Wally in October of, I think it was 2016. Uh, he came out slimmer and trimmer. He actually found a girlfriend the following year. It was really interesting. Nikki does a really great job of chronicling the wildlife uh, activities in her yard. But I thought, you know, having seen now, you guys have seen the what the, the pelt looks like. This is what it looks like when it's stretched around a very um, roly-poly and ready-for-winter woodchuck. Now, um, one of the things that woodchucks are taking advantage of right now is are so many other creatures are the absolute plethora of mast, uh, the the fruit of our nut-bearing trees, our uh, acorns, our hickory nuts, our walnuts. They're just everywhere these days. In fact, I was talking to a gentleman last week. Um, he was standing near the burr oak tree that's out in front of Good Nature World Headquarters, and he uh, pointed to the top of his head, and he said that... Uh, he had done some work over at the Morton Arboretum and, and he had a acorn hit him. That little point on the end of the acorn went down. He said it actually made a, a dent and it, it caused kind of a bruise on the top of his skull. So um, be careful, appreciate um, all that we've got going on out there, but yeah, do be careful. This I took this picture for... Um, I might be using it for a column. We'll have to see if I if I write about mast years or not. But masting um, a mast year occurs when um, trees throughout an area will just produce prodigious quantities of uh, their fruits, and it happens uh, happens anywhere from two every two to five years. Now we always associate acorns with oak trees, but you, you may or may not have noticed that not every year has the same amount of production. Some years are, are quite low and some years are quite high. Uh, there's a, a number of different thoughts on why that occurs. Some has to do with um, what the, the weather conditions are in the spring when the trees are, when they're, they're flowering, how many of those flowers get pollinated would uh, influence or direct how many um, how many fruits are produced. Um, but there's there's other thoughts too because it um, it seems to be um, regional. I remember one year corresponding with a friend of mine that worked at at Will County, and I was talking about all the bur oak trees. Uh, in our area, having just these massive amounts of, of acorns. And she said that they had barely any by her. And we were not that far apart to have, you know, significantly different weather patterns. So 
Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of digging into it right now. If I find out more, uh, it's going to get turned into a column and then we can talk about it some more next week. But for right now, this is your warning. Watch your head, watch your ankles too, because if like th this is, was a picture that I took this out in front of um, uh, world headquarters the other day, walking on this many acorns is kind of like walking on marbles. Uh, you you really got to watch your step too. It's even worse with walnuts. So uh, in, enjoy the, the productivity of the uh, nut bearing trees around you. But yeah, use a little caution while you're doing it. I thought this was cute. I got in the, the van uh, today at work. There's world headquarters in the background. And this acorn had fallen off of the tree um, and just landed on top of the park district van. I thought that was pretty cool. In fact, I brought it home. I have it here. I can show it to you later. It's huge. It's like a gumball, giant gumball. Uh, and then uh, I found this on my front. So I've got a little, I've got the front step and then I've got the threshold for the door. Some little creature, I'm guessing a squirrel stashed this walnut by the front door. I, I kind of want to adjust the security camera that I have out there just to see um what you know when it gets eaten and what it is that's going to eat it I'm, I'm assuming it's a squirrel and i i've never been able to find a definitive answer on why they will bury most of their cash for the winter but then they kind of hedge their bets by putting things in places like this this is the you know the front step uh i found them on the uh, propane tank of my grill and then I know we talked about this it's been a while but you see them stuffed in the um in the crotches or the, the branches of trees you know maybe 10 feet up in the air so I, I think it's to to hedge their bets come winter time but it's it's never enough quantity to you know it's a single nut here and a single nut there it wouldn't really be enough to tide them over should we get uh, like a major blizzard or something but maybe you know they're much better at living their lives than we are at figuring them out but um yeah maybe you guys will see stuff like this too not stashed in interesting places so this is a, a peek at the the side of my yard that i quit mowing a couple of years ago and i had um this isn't why I stopped mowing, but it, it um, I, I had as kind of a, a follow along to, or what do I want to say, as a a side benefit of of not mowing. I've I've got these big um, lambs quarter plants, and these things are massive. They've got to be seven, eight feet tall. I didn't know lamb's quarters got that big, but I, I had watched a, a video last year about harvesting the seeds. Um, they're pretty prodigious uh, seed makers. If you've, if, if, uh, so lamb's quarters is a plant that was, was brought here as a food item. It's actually supposed to be pretty nutritious. Um, you can eat the leaves and you can eat the seeds. Um, you can grind the seeds. You can use the seeds as you would like poppy seeds or something like that. Um, I, I, like I said, I watched a, a kind of an interesting video on how you harvest the seeds. Um, you put a, a paper bag over the end of the plant and you shake it and you collect the seeds and then you can, you can grind them. You can take the seed covers off. Um, Anyway, I was out uh, looking at the <laughs> lamb's quarter crop the other day to see how it's doing. And it's got a ways to go before uh, those seeds are going to form. If, if my eyes didn't deceive me, it's still flowering. Now, I tried to take a picture outside here um, and the the plant, the, the flowers quiver, uh, even when there was barely any breeze. Uh, so then I tried holding it to hold it still and that was just as bad so then I brought it up here on the deck I clipped off a little piece put, brought it up on the deck laid it down and even that even just the slightest breeze was causing uh these uh the ends here were the the flowering ends of the plant 
uh, to quiver. So then I went inside where ostensibly there is not any wind. And I took this photo. Uh, look, it's it's really interesting looking a little flowering. Let's let's zoom in here. Um boy, even at this it's not terribly clear, but um in, for a plant that most people regard as a weed, it's got some really interesting structures. And all of these are going to be turning into seeds. I wonder if it quivers a lot because it self-pollinates. I'll have to look that up. I'm not exactly sure how this plant operates. I would imagine since these flowers aren't um, terribly noticeable and I didn't see a lot of pollinator activity, this may be something that's wind pollinated. So maybe they just jiggle around and, and uh, self-fertilize. Um, I have, to, like, I'll have to check on that. But I'll also keep you posted as to the seed crop and uh, what I end up doing with them. But lamb's quarters, and uh, regarded as a weed, but most weeds um, are just plants that are out of place. And this plant was brought here for the purpose of providing food. So we'll see how it goes. I'll let you know. And this was a little curiosity. This was uh, during a walk last week in the Hickory Knolls natural area. We saw this by the side of the trail. And if we zoom in on that, we can see this is the, uh, what looks like the remains of a bald-faced hornet's nest. Uh, and, it, and it is a bald-faced hornet's nest, but it turns out it's not the remains. The nest, for whatever reason, was built down low like this it's 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 on the ground and it's still active there's a a little wasp right there uh, let's go i think i've got a closer up one here yeah it was um so i don't know if if somebody kicked it uh if an animal because um in animals like uh skunks will feed on a wasp they particularly like the developing larvae uh, I don't know how this nest came to lose the side as it did, but um, there was a fair amount of activity, comings and goings. Here's a wasp. There's a wasp. <laughs> the uh, This is a, a species that posts uh, guards at the entrance. Now, the entrance to this, I wonder, you know, they're usually down at the bottom because these things are up high in the tree. So the nest entrance would be somewhere here down low. I don't know if they followed that plan when as they built this uh, really remarkable structure. I can never get enough of looking at how these are put together. This is all paper that the uh, insects made by scraping and chewing, combining with their saliva, um, dried wood. Uh, they love old fence posts and, and siding that isn't uh, stained or or sealed in some other way and you can see the different colors form as they uh what would be the nice word well the not nice word would be spit uh <laughs> expel what they have been chewing on uh, to build this nest so yeah i would imagine the opening had been down here maybe after if, if all of these pieces stay there maybe i'll go take a look at it again when there's not active wasps guarding it uh and see if they they put the the entrance down at the bottom because that would that would seem hard to get you think you know down on the ground like this they would want to exit from up here i don't know just kind of a cool kind of a surprise and by the way you know we walked right by i got fairly close to it and get stung their their reputation for stinging it it they do from what i understand deliver a painful sting but i tell you i've looked at a lot of these nests some with active wasps i've just i've never gotten stung i got wood <laughs> so this this was an interesting little item um this we found this during the uh it's our fox river day uh cleanup event that was uh, this past Saturday. And this was over at uh, Fearson Creek Park as we were putting the the last, uh, emptying the last pickup truck load of trash uh, from the river 
uh, putting it into the giant dumpster at Pearson Creek Park. And uh, this was rolling around on the on the bed of the truck. And so Ryan, our uh, restoration ecologist, picked it up. And he goes, what do you make of this? And first glance, doesn't it kind of look like a, you know, like a strawberry you forgot at the back of the refrigerator? Uh, but it didn't feel like a strawberry. And, and if we look closely, I, I do have some experience in that realm. I have forgotten strawberries at the back of the fridge. Um, these areas where there would be seeds, you can actually still see the seeds. The color is about right for a forgotten strawberry, but there's no seeds. Um, and it just, it felt kind of uh, almost rubbery. You could push on these sides. Well, as it was, I ended up pushing a little bit too hard and I opened it. And what it is, is um, this is an oak apple gall in, a, in an early stage of development. Um, oak apple galls are formed by wasps that, um, tiny, tiny little wasps, um, not anything nearly as big as, as what we saw there in that wasp nest. Um, but they... Um, they lay an egg on the leaf of an oak tree and that uh, there's uh, some uh, chemicals that produce a reaction in the oak leaf that causes this tissue to start growing and encircling the egg and the subsequent larva. And then the larva stays in here and feeds on this material that grows from the leaf. Uh, a lot of times they do break off. Um, the oak apple galls break off. Um, we see a lot of these at this time of year. Um, they grow so that uh, this one was about the size of a ping pong ball. Uh, I'm sorry, this one was about the size of a uh, uh, marble. This was about the size of a, a ping pong ball, maybe even a little bit bigger than that. So um, the uh, you, you see these, uh, sometimes they're on the ground, sometimes they're still attached to the leaf. As the leaves come down, uh, you'll find them uh, places. They only occur on oak. So uh, if you're in an area, an oak woodland, or if you've got an oak tree in your yard, keep an eye open for this. Um, this one, I think I tried to show you this video um, a few months ago, and it's, it's, I think it's just long enough. Oh, no, there it goes. So this was an oak apple gall at uh, Del Nor Woods Park. And it was it was just the funniest thing. It, I was standing, I, I can't remember what I was looking at. I, I was not looking at This thing came rolling past me and it just kept going. Um, so I kind of, chased after it wasn't like i was on a hill or anything there must have been just enough breeze to keep it going made me wonder about the little larvae inside if it was uh you know getting dizzy <laughs> as it rolled along after it, it stopped like that i did put it off to the side i i'm not sure when they detached from leaf because this was back in i want to say this was back in may I don't know if that when they detach like that, if there's enough food to survive or if that dries out, if that larva doesn't survive. I, I'm not sure about that either. But anyway, they're, they're cool phenomenon of our local oak trees. Something to be aware of and keep an eye out for. Uh, and then Miss Bonnie, I don't know if you were with us this evening, but um, this was um, an unfortunate consequence of our ongoing fall migration. This was, uh, I believe Bonnie said that this was um, being chased by a blue jay. Maybe there was a confrontation at a feeder. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but um, that does happen a lot of times when a bird is moving and in, in sort of a panic state or in a hurried state trying to get out of the way of another bird. Uh, oftentimes it's like a hawk, uh, but uh, they crash into a window. So looking at this, I thought, boy, you know, that looks kind of like a uh, uh, beak. Uh, we can we zoom in, can we zoom in here a little bit? You can kind of see the gross beak, the large beak on this animal. 
Well, then Bonnie thoughtfully uh, turned it over so that we could see its underside. Uh, and in immature rose-breasted grosbeaks, the, the females uh, have yellow under their wings, but the males have this uh, rosy uh, reddish pink color. So I do believe that's what uh, we we're looking at there, the um, now deceased uh, immature male rose-breasted rose beak. Yeah, my, migration, you know, it's uh, it's not an easy time. We like to think of it as, oh, lucky them, they get to fly south for the winter. But um, yeah, it's uh, they're traveling through unfamiliar territories. Uh, they, they, they're you know, looking for food sources in areas that they, they don't know well. Um, it's It can be stressful and, and sometimes they don't survive. So I appreciate you, uh, sending those pictures, Bonnie. And again, if you're there, I believe you said you'd put it in the freezer so that we could get it to the Field Museum. Uh, that would be, at least it wouldn't die in vain, then it could um, donate its body to science. Uh, no, um, this was a interesting little development. My, my friend Peggy out in DeKalb County, she is helping the Sycamore Park District rehome a number of animals that were being kept there uh, by a former employee, uh, by an employee who's now former. And um, she said, you know, she was telling me about the, all these salamanders. She said, there's nine salamanders here. And she said, I think some of them are spotted salamanders. Now, uh, the the species, now I, I can't speak as well to DeKalb County as I can to Kane County, but here in Kane County, we have the tiger salamander. That is our salamander. Uh, we don't have a lot of salamander diversity here. Um, probably the only other salamander we could find in this area would be the, the eastern newt, um, which is pretty unusual to find. There's a few pockets of them around here, but tiger salamanders are what we have around here. And tiger salamanders, when they um, transform, when they leave the water and come out on land, because uh, they're, they're amphibians, so the first part of their life is spent in the water after they hatch from an egg. They live, um, well, they're actually called larvae, but they, they look like tadpoles with front legs and back legs. And then they've also got uh, frilly gills around uh, near their head, which is something tadpoles lack. But uh, when, when a tiger salamander uh, metamorphoses, and leaves the water, um, they don't really have any spots. And then um, as they age within the first couple of years, they start to develop uh, their tiger-like markings, which usually first start out as spots. But then over time, the yellow um, spots spread out and become more stripe-like, which is one of the reasons they're called tiger salamanders. So anyway, a young Tiger salamander can sometimes look a little bit like a spotted salamander, which is another species entirely. Um, and Peggy, she said, you know, I always struggle with, is it a young tiger or is it a spotted salamander? Well, these, look at how these rows of spots are paired down the backs of these salamanders. You can also, um, if you're, if you know your salamander facts and figures you can count these here these are called the costal grooves and the spotted salamander has a different number of costal grooves than the uh, tiger salamander um, but yeah, these these are are pretty clearly spotted salamanders um, this is a, a range map uh, or it's just an incident uh, incident map uh, from iNaturalist, it shows an, all the observations that have been made of tiger salamanders here in uh, around Illinois. And you can see, um, let's see, here's Naperville. So um, and we're over here and there's, there's just not, um, we don't see spotted salamanders on here. So 
nobody knows where this former employee got these salamanders from. The upshot is um they and and they've they've also lived in captivity. That's the other thing with with amphibians. Once they've been in captivity, uh even for a short period of time, uh, if if they're let go again, they you can risk introducing uh, foreign uh, pathogens, bacteria, things that wouldn't uh, normally be found amongst the wild population. So uh, these these things can't be released one because we don't know where they came from, and two they've been in captivity too long. So she's actually uh, looking for nature centers that might be looking. Uh, to create a spotted salamander display. Um, there were also some tigers. So there were, I said there were nine salamanders total. Five of them were spotted and four of them look like this, which is the some of the most brilliantly colored tiger salamanders I've ever seen. Um, the ones we have around here tend to look more like this. Um, the colors, there, there's markings here and again as these individuals get older the the lighter markings uh that will get more numerous like we see here on the tail but um to have this vivid yellow i kind of wonder if maybe these are were were uh, something that were purchased uh i know people who breed these animals for the the, the pet trade value bright colors and in uh bold patterns like that so um she is uh, piggy is going to keep a couple of spotted salamanders and a couple of um tiger salamanders but if, if any of you know of uh, nature center she would like to keep these as education animal within the education animal realm as opposed to handing them off as pets but if any of you are aware of a nature center looking for a display animals um these are too they're really pretty quite handsome um and, and so as i was digging out this picture so you could see what uh a usual cane county tiger salamander looks like i came across this one and i i don't know that we've ever i've ever shared this story this is a this is a tiger salamander too uh, and it it was found in this condition, and you will never guess where. Um, this was given to us by uh, a gentleman named Michael, who is our uh, very long-term and highly dedicated um, birdhouse volunteer. He maintains the Purple Martin houses as well as the Bluebird slash Tree Swallow houses uh, that are by hickory knolls and in the hickory knolls natural area um well one fall uh, a few years back he was cleaning out the purple martin houses which are up on poles probably what 15 feet in the air and here he finds this dried out salamander now, um, purple martins are insectivores, so it's not like they caught this thing and brought it back to their house and then decided not to eat it. Um, and salamanders, uh, they they dig, they dig down, they're quite adept at digging, but they they don't climb. They don't have sticky toe pads. They're not like a tree, uh, tree frog that would climb up uh, a pole and get in a, a birdhouse. Plus, there's predator guards on those those uh, martin houses, so nothing can really climb up and gain access. We think what happened. Uh, Mike says he has witnessed this. Um, great horned owls, which we do have uh, at Hickory, uh, owls uh, will perch on top of the martin houses. He said sometimes they'll even beat their wings against the martin houses to drive the martins out, and then they'll. You know they'll fly and catch one, but he said that they that they will also use the uh, top of the Martin House as a feeding perch. So he's thinking that an owl uh, caught a salamander. Salamanders, if they're going to be out and moving around, it's either going to be on a rainy day or at night. So again, the the, the time period would match up more with a uh, an owl. He's maybe a hawk, but uh, most likely an owl caught this salamander and flew up to the top of the Martin house and then 
who knows what happened the 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 salamander wiggled away the they do have a defensive chemical and you know maybe the the owl tried to take a bite and it was yucky and they dropped it but um the, the salamander was able to escape getting eaten but it wasn't able to escape being 15 feet in the air probably saw one of the openings in the martin house as a as a very convenient little hidey hole to run into to get away from the owl but then it was equally doomed because it's up in the air um, in a box that can heat up to oh, probably close to or maybe even over 100 degrees on a on a hot summer day and thus it met its end um i might even still have the salamander somewhere i remember taking this picture uh in case i, I lost the animal um or if you know somebody else cleaned my desk out for me but anyway that's the story uh of this salamander and um uh, how it came to be now this uh this i just got this this morning this is from uh, jill who's an, another member of our ecological restoration team and she was working on seeds day we were actually supposed to have a district-wide uh work day over at Pearson Creek Fent, but because of the rain this morning, it got uh, postponed a couple of weeks. Um, but she said, oh, look, look, I have a friend. And I don't know exactly who this friend is other than that it is a weevil. And weevils, weevils are a type of uh, beetle I um, was thinking, boy, wouldn't it be cool if we could figure out what kind of beetle it is? Well, I can't tell you how many times my head spun around when I started trying to figure this thing out. Um, here's a little excerpt from uh, Bug Guide. So they're the, the family uh, Curculionidae, which are the snout uh, and bark beetles. Um, there are snout beetles and uh, weevils which refers to this prominent growth here. So this is actually the, the mouth parts are at the end of this, um, what is technically called a rostrum. You can see its eyes are here. Weevils um, can be identified by this elbowed antenna here. Uh, so Jill just happened to notice this little friend hanging out on a stem. She's, I said, she texted it to me and I thought, you know, some, sometimes you can get lucky. And when you, when you find an insect on a, a plant, sometimes that insect's entire life cycle revolves around that plant. So if you know the plant, you can identify the bug. Uh, in this case, it wasn't quite so easy. Um, as bug guide says, um, it, uh, the, this, family of beetles is arguably the largest animal family. So not just the largest beetle family, but the largest animal family. It's more than 50,000 species in 4,600 genera. Uh, that's worldwide. Um, in the U.S., let me move this bar up out of the way here. The U.S. has um, 2,500 species in 480 genera. Um, amongst 19 subfamilies. So that's uh, within North America. So that's that's a lot of weevils and snout beetles and bark beetles. Um, the bark beetles, I don't believe, have this uh, rostrum, this prominent rostrum, um, but they, they are still part of this larger family. So, so we don't know, Jill was working, she, I, uh, that she was processing seeds and I said oh by the way what uh what seeds are you working on she said sedges um this thing could have fallen off from a sedge uh it there's there's uh, weevils associated with all sorts of plants there's a in just doing a, a quick little search on bug guide there was um a group of weevils that are known to inhabit and feed on. Uh, by the way, they they are uh, they feed on plants. Some of them are actually kind of uh, damaging to the plant. That uh, some of them are even considered major agricultural pests. But 
Um, there are some that feed on asters and gosh, asters are everywhere right now. It, it would be absolutely possible that a, a weevil that was hanging out on an aster could get knocked into the bucket as they were harvesting, uh, collecting the seeds from the uh, the sedges. But they are really cool looking, aren't they? Here's that, that elbow antenna. It's uh, boing, pointing downward. There's the uh, snout or rostrum. Uh, mouth parts are here. This would be where it would chew into um, the plant. I believe too, the females, when they, they, I believe they chew a hole and then deposit an egg. I That sounds a little, usually the ovipositor does all the work when they're putting eggs in. I, I could be wrong on that, but um, the, uh, you'd think the, you know, that this would be a nose, like, you know, we're accustomed to seeing with anteaters, uh, but um, the mouth parts are here at the end. Super cool little find. And it actually, um, we got, uh, we got time here. Yeah. For one more story. So this, you'll never guess where my brain went after this. Um, so this, um, is a postcard. I, 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 I ended up buying it on eBay. I was so excited to see it. This is a postcard from Holloman's Cotton Patch Restaurant, which was uh, quite the place to be in San Diego. If we go back into the 50s uh, and 60s, they had um, uh, they were known for their uh, their steaks. Uh, they had an entertainment room called the Bayou Room. Well, this this was a, a restaurant that was started by my dad's cousin. My my grandma before she got married was a Holloman. And uh, some of her brother George's uh, kids during, uh, after their service in World War II, they headed west uh, and uh, some landed in uh, Southern California. One, my dad's cousin, Dick, he had a, a dance band at Mountain Shadows Resort in, um, in Arizona, but they, they were, they were they're an interesting branch of the family, kind of, you know, lots of brushes with Hollywood and fame. Um, and this was their restaurant. Now, they they uh, took the success of this restaurant and they used that to expand their restaurant empire into the realm of uh, kind of fast food. There was a little bit more service to it uh, than than like a McDonald's. But um, what do you call? a chain of restaurants that spring out from a place called the Cotton Patch. This is where the connection comes in. You call them bowl weevils, <laughs> um, which I don't know. I, I remember meeting, um, you know, cousin, my dad's cousin, George, and uh, he'd be George Jr., I believe. And, um, you know, that time in the 1970s, the restaurants were, they, they, by the way, none of these are open anymore. I think the last bowl we will closed uh, like in the last 10 years or something like that. Boy, you know, if only I'd been born maybe, you know, 20 years earlier, I could have jumped on this and we could have done some, uh, we could have made this a little more um, realistic. The, you know, if you're going to have a something named a bull weevil, wouldn't you want to have the weevil have that magnificent rostrum? Uh, again, it's uh, my understanding of bull weevils is that they are serious pests of cotton patches. And um, so I don't know that I would have named them bull weevils anyway, but I can't argue with success. They were tremendously successful for quite some time. Um, but uh, I did not order the matchbook. I only ordered the postcard. Uh, this was what's on the back of it, though. They're famous for their half pound steer burgers. They offer soft drinks, beer, and pool. And boy, I'd drink to that. Um, that's what, uh, what can you hear? Geneva, <laughs> Geneva High School band must have started practicing. All right, let me, um, let me stop the share. You picking that up, or is that? I don't know if the microphone's picking that up or not. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it is. Got a little accompaniment here for the end. Well, folks, uh, looks like we got just a couple of chats here before we wind things up. Um, uh, well, so, uh, I thought I'd heard there were, there were two types of squirrels, hoarders and scatterers. Um, so I know like, um, chip, so in the squirrel family, there's the chipmunks are part of that. Um, brown squirrels are part of that. Brown hogs are part of the squirrel family. So with our, most of our, uh, our, our gray squirrels and our fox squirrels, I've always heard of them as being scatter hoarders, which means they bury stuff, one here, one there. And then uh, chipmunks who are in the squirrel family are larger hoarders. So are the little um, red squirrels that you see up up north. Um, uh, they're actually downstate uh, a little ways from here too, around uh, Kankakee and Southern Will County has little, the, the chattery, very noisy red squirrels. They're smaller than our gray squirrel and our fox squirrel. And they um, uh, will make big uh, caches too. Now, I, I did have someone send me a picture of uh, underneath the hood of their car, there was a whole bunch of nuts. And I don't know, when I found caches like that, I've always assumed that they were um, either mice or chipmunks. So I, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Or I, I've, in my mind, well, Wallace, I've always put fox squirrels and gray squirrels as scatter hoarders. So they, um, they scatter their cache, they scatter their hoard all around. Um, and then they have, um, in fact, their brain expands as they um, hide all of this food that they're putting up for the winters because they, they um, have to remember where they put it. And the percentages I've read anywhere from like 40 to something like 75% of what they bury, they're able to recover uh, through spatial memory cues, um, which is pretty impressive because like I, you know, I had poured myself uh, a beverage to have and enjoy with you this evening. And, and I don't remember where I put it. <laughs> I couldn't have poured it more than a, you know, an hour ago. So, so yeah, that's, that's in my mind now, I, I could do a little more checking to see if there's, if there are squirrels, tree squirrels, fox squirrels, gray squirrels that create larders. Um, But in my mind, they're separate. They they are scattered hoarders. Um, hornets aren't as nasty as yellow jackets, and it sounds like you're talking from experience there. Um, you know, both of them uh, create nests out of paper. The yellow jackets are in the ground. The the hornets are uh, up high, and I would I have been stung by yellow jackets. I think what what yellow jackets um, have that hornets don't. Uh, or the what we call the bald-faced hornet, which is actually just a, another type of paper wasp. But they, um, anytime I've been stung by a yellow jacket, um, it's either I've stepped on the nest and angered them, or I've I've put my hand. I, I think I told you guys about how I made the video of the yellow jackets living in the the tree trunk. And I was so proud of myself that I didn't get stung. I made like 30 seconds of video of their comings and goings. And then as I walked away, they tracked me down and stung me from like 50 yards down the path. Um, I did get stung one time. Uh, one had crawled into, I had a, I was actually out here on the deck. I was, uh, it was staining the deck. And um, one crawled in my can of Dr. Pepper and I didn't know it was in there and I got stung on the lip. Um, something I had read about their behavior that's that's interesting at this time of the year. So the, the workers in the the uh, uh, yellow jacket colony, their job is to take care of the queen and uh, provision, you know, bring food back for the larvae. Um, at this time of year, the queen's production, egg production, is starting to slow down. She's nearing the end of her life. Um, it's this time is when they're sending uh, the future queens out. Uh, they will mate with the uh, males. The males will die. 
the future queens are the only part of the colony that will survive till next year. Well, um, since there's not as many larvae to feed, the uh, the workers are out and about. Uh, yellow jacket larvae, and I don't know if this is true of all wasps or if this is a yellow jacket thing, but they will produce, and there's a, gosh, there's a name for it. I don't remember what it is, but they will produce this sweet liquid as a like a reward or an incentive for the workers to feed them. So the workers are getting um, a, a benefit from bringing food back to the larvae. Since there's not as many larvae, they're not getting that sweet reward that they've become accustomed to. So um, they're out looking for other sources of sugary treats, which include our drinks. Uh, they also, at this time of year, because the, the, the colony is as big as it's ever going to be, all, all of these um, larvae that have, have matured, um, I guess I had one on my hand the other day and it was, it was actually, um, pulling it. It didn't break the skin, but it was tugging pretty hard and it was pulling, um, little, just little bits of skin, uh, off of my hand, um, watched it for a while and then it flew away. Um, <laughs> I worked under hornet's nest, they would fall out and bonk me on the head and then fly away often. <laughs> so were, were, were these drunk? <laughs> were they drunk hornets? Um, and then the acceptable distance between the nest and the human shrinks through the season. Yeah, I, I think they do get more and more ornery. I don't know if they can sense that their time is, is drawing near or that they, or they, things are just going to come to one very cold bitter end um i do know uh we've got around here we've got the eastern yellow jacket and the german yellow jacket and the um they were busy just getting on okay so they weren't they weren't you know <laughs> tippling um german yellow jackets from what i understand were, were accidental introductions here in the united states and they were said to have come over in shipments of wood and I don't know if this is across the board, but um, again, this is something I've adopted in my brain that if the yellow jackets are coming out of a hole in the ground, then they're the Eastern yellow jackets. And they've uh, made a nest in uh, an abandoned chipmunk burrow. If they're coming out, and, and we see this at the park district a lot, we've got different areas that have um, landscaping timbers or uh, old railroad ties that are used to hold back um, embankments and stuff. And uh, a lot of times we'll see yellow jackets in there. I think those are the German yellow jackets. I think they have a, an affinity for nesting in wood and Eastern have um, a preference for the ground. Um, again, maybe that's something I've just made up in my head, but that's, that's what I've observed. They've gone about getting sometimes stung <laughs> by these things we call the yellow jackets. Um, oh, Diane, uh, I have a yellow Ohio buckeye in uh, Camden Hills backyard, and I've never seen so many buckeyes. So they're in on this too. Huh? So, um, yeah, there's, uh, it's a, it's a huge mass here. And, you know, since we were not doing the screen share, this is the side, this is, this is the acorn that was on, um, the, uh, the roof of the van. Now, if I get, you know, two and five eighths inch measure. Oh, here's our lip balm. This is a really big acorn. This is over an inch in diameter. Um, I would imagine that it would give a pretty good poke if it bonked you on the head. I think you'd be aware of it. Um, so yeah, the, lots and lots. I'm. The last, and it seemed like we had a mass year just a couple of years ago. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago. I remember writing a column about one of the years when the production was low. Uh, trees will hold back. Um, takes a lot of resources to produce this much fruit. Um, so there, there is uh, maybe next year going to be a, a drop in the number of nuts uh, so the trees can recover that also there's going to be a rebound effect too when there's this much food 
out laying around um the things that eat uh, this food uh, they're going to have a, a relatively easy time surviving uh through fall and winter the animals whether they cache their food and in, in a, a hoard um uh, or, or a larder or whether they they scatter it around there's plenty to be had right now this doesn't even have sometimes you know you'll see like a little hole where uh an acorn weevil has um deposited some eggs and this one doesn't even have it's heavy it doesn't have um it was not um doesn't have weevils living inside of it but um so you know the the things that eat these nuts, the the numbers are going to go up, whether it's uh, deer or rodents. But then next year, if if we have a drop in the mass cup, if we have a very low mass year, then um, those numbers are going to drop off again. So uh, as always, populations do this in response to the uh, conditions around them. Um. That's all we got tonight, folks. Um, uh, appreciate you tuning in. Appreciate your observations, your comments, uh, your time, of course. And um, ah, we'll not see you next week. Next week uh, is a, an off week, a bye week, or whatever you want to call it. We will not be convening next week. So the next time we get together will be in October. So uh, enjoy the rest of your September, the rest of your week, the rest of your evening. I'm going to go find that drink that I poured. <laughs> I'll see you again soon. <laughs> night, Pam. <laughs> Good night, Pam. Good night. Thank you, Pam. Thank you Thank again. You. See you in two weeks. Sounds good. <laughs>